Welcome to the POCRN study guide for the CCRN exam. My name is Gozi and I will be narrating this audio study guide. In this study guide, we will discuss cardiac assessment for the CCRN exam. Let's get started. The heart is a pump. It pumps blood to all parts of the body. What things are necessary for the heart to work properly? The heart valves, the heart's blood supply, the heart's electrical system, and the muscles of the heart. The heart has four valves. They help maintain forward flow of blood in the heart. The heart's blood vessels supply the heart with oxygenated blood, and the heart's electrical system control how fast the heart beats as well as heart rhythm. The heart's muscle provide the actual pumping action of the heart. So there's a practice CCRN test on the ASCN website. It has about 10 questions. And the last question is a cardiac assessment question. It went something like this. Patient was status post-surgery, patient was fine, and suddenly the patient started complaining of shortness of breath and some other sy symptoms. On assessment, the patient was found to have uh, a loud S2 sound, which is an S2 sound that's louder than usual. And um, it said, what could be the cause of the patient's symptoms? Two of the options I remember was uh, PE, pulmonary embolus, and pneumonia. As we go through this section, we'll find out the answer to this question. When we do a cardiac assessment, we do a whole bunch of things. We do an EKG, we get a blood pressure, we ask the patient about their history, and we do a physical. Part of the physical is listening for heart sounds. When we listen for heart sounds, we could hear normal heart sounds and we could hear abnormal heart sounds. Now, in a normal, healthy adult, we have two heart sounds, the S1 sound and the S2 sound. These two sounds are made by the closure of the heart valves. The S1 and S2 sound is the lugged up sounds that we're supposed to hear um, per our textbooks. Now, you hear the S1 sound when the mitral and tricuspid valves close and the S2 sounds when the aortic and pulmonic valves close. We listen for a mitral S1 sound at the fifth intercostal space, mid-clavicular line. We listen for the S1 sound of the tricuspid valve at the fourth or fifth intercostal space, um, left sternal border. Um, different books gave me different locations, but all of the textbooks always said left sternal border. So if you know at which exact point to listen for the S1 sound of the tricuspid valve, please put in the comments below. Um, the S1 sound is loudest at the apex of the heart. It also signals the end of diastole and the start of systole. We can listen for the aortic S2 sound at the second intercostal space, right sternal border, and listen for the pulmonic S2 sound at the second intercostal space, left sternal border. The S2 sound is loudest at the base of the heart, and it splits on inspiration, usually, but in a right bundle branch block, the split is wide and fixed. In pulmonary embolism, that's in PE, the S2 sound is usually louder than usual. Now, S2, S2 indicates the end of systole and the start of diastole. And here we also have an answer to the question that was on the uh, AACN website about the loud S2 sound. So when we have a loud S2 sound, it means that most likely we have a PE or pulmonary embolism. One thing I want to note here is that when I took the CCRN exam, I had one question that asked about uh, an aus auscultation site for one of the um, one of the valves. So um, it's something. Now let's talk about abnormal findings on a cardiac assessment. Um, so we're going to talk about abnormal heart sounds. So S3 and S4 are abnormal heart sounds um, that can happen in adults. Um, they're best heard with the bell of a stethoscope at the apex of the heart. So if we're listening with the bell of a stethoscope, it means they're low-pitched sounds. So S3 is caused by blood rushing into a weak dilated ventricle, and it happens right after S2. It causes a ventricular gallop that sounds like Kentucky. Um, S3 is associated with um, heart failure and may occur before crackles um, are heard in the lungs. 
um, S3 is caused by pulmonary hypertension and incompetent valves, incompetent mitral tricuspid or aortic valves. S4, on the other hand, is a heart sound that's generated when the atria has to contract and squeeze blood into a, a ventricle that's non-compliant and stiff. It usually happens right after S1 and causes an atrial gallop that sounds like Tennessee. S4 is caused by conditions that reduce ventricular compliance, that re reduce the compliance of the ventricles, such as a myocardial infarction, that's an MI, is ischemia, ventricular hypertrophy, and aortic stenosis. So now in aortic stenosis, the left ventricle has to push blood um, through a very narrow aortic valve. That means it has to push harder. So because it's pushing harder than usual, its muscles start to get bigger and stiffer. So this causes the left ventricle to now be um, stiff and non-compliant. Next, we're going to discuss pericardial friction rub. Um, this is a sound um, and it sounds like a rub. Um, so the heart is wrapped by the pericardium and the pericardium has two layers. It has an inner layer and an outer layer and there's a space between both of them. Uh, inflammation of the pericardium or the layers of the pericardium um, is called pericarditis. Now pericarditis um, could be caused by several things. It could be caused by inflammation, infection. Um, it could happen after an MI, after a cabbage or after trauma to the heart. Um, so when you listen to the heart, you hear that rubbing sound. And that rubbing sound is generated by the inner and outer layer of the heart rubbing against each other. So when a patient has um, pericarditis, they usually complain of um, chest pain. And, you know, um, a lot of things cause chest pain. Um, some distinguishing factors of the chest pain caused by pericarditis is that the pain is positional. So when the patient is sitting up, the pain is better. When the patient lays down, the pain gets worse. The pain is also worse when the patient takes a deep breath. So the pain is worse on inspiration. Um, also, when you do an EKG, um, ST elevations are in all the leads. Diffuse ST elevations, it's everywhere. Um, so with pericarditis, we have diffuse ST elevations on EKG. We have the pericardial friction rub and we have chest pain. So on cardiac assessment, we could also hear um, abnormal sounds um, in form of murmurs. So murmurs are heart sounds generated by turbulent blood flow through the heart's valves. So I made a concept map to help me understand um, this concept better. So the concept map starts with a valve at the top, starts with the valves. And then next under that, I have stenosis and I have um, regurgitant. So, which means that to generate a murmur, the valve is either stenotic or regurgitant. So, when the valve is stenotic, it means it is narrow. And usually, stenosis of a valve occurs over time. So, stenosis of the valve is usually a chronic problem. A valve is insufficient when it opens at a time when it should be closed. This is usually a chronic or acute problem. Now, under stenosis and regurgitant, I have diastole and systole on both sides. So meaning a murmur of stenosis could be during diastole or systole, and that also a murmur of insufficiency could be during diastole or systole. We're going to do talk about stenosis first. Now, during diastole and when there's stenosis, um, blood is rushing through through the AV valves, that that is the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve. Now, if they are narrow, we're going to hear a murmur of stenosis during diastole when blood is going through the atrioventricular valves. On the other side, I have systole. Now, during systole, blood is rushing through the ventricles, um, is rushing from the ventricles and through the semilunar valves. That is the aortic valve and the pulmonic valve. Now, if they're stenotic, if they are narrow, we will hear a murmur of stenosis during systole because blood is rushing out of the ventricles and through those two valves. 
So to recap, um, in stenosis, we can have um, a diastole, a, di a murmur during diastole or a murmur during systole. The diastolic murmur involves the AV valves because blood is going through the AV valves during diastole. And if the AV valves are stenotic, we'll get a murmur of stenosis. On the other side, if we have a murmur of stenosis during systole, then the semilunar valves are involved the aortic valve and the pulmonic valve. Uh, in this case, we will hear um, a stenotic murmur during systole. That is, systen that is stenosis. Now we're going to talk about um, regurgitant valves. So we can hear um, a regurgitant murmur during diastole or systole. Now, if we hear a regurgitant um, murmur during diastole, it means that a valve that should be closed is open. So during diastole, the semilunar valves should be closed. That is the aortic valve and the pulmonic valve. But if they are regurgitant, they will open. So during diastole, if we hear a regurgitant murmur, it means the semilunar valves are involved. That is the aortic valve and the pulmonic valve. On the other hand, when we go to systole, during systole, the atrioventricular valves should be closed. That is the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve. So when we hear a murmur of cyst of, um, when we hear a regurgitant murmur during systole, most likely the AV valves are involved. That is the mitral valve and tricuspid valve because they should be closed. Now the sound of uh, a stenotic murmur and the sound of regurgitant murmur are different. So this is how I explain it to myself or how I understand it. During stenosis, you have the blood rushing through a narrow valve. So the, it's like when you have people kind of rushing through a, rushing through a small um, door. So you have a few people rush, um, getting through, kind of trying to make the the um, door bigger and, and they make it a little bigger and then more people can go through. So the more people you have, the bigger the sound gets and then you have less and less people. So the sound starts, starts low, gets bigger and gets low. So that's the, what a murmur of stenosis sounds like. So in my imagination, so the two murmurs are, are different. Um, they sound different, so that's one way to kind of tell them apart when we listen with our stethoscope. Now, um, these heart murmurs, like we said before, um, are caused by problems with the valves. So things that could cause um, diseases of the heart valves are uh, coronary artery disease, um, an MI. So in the case of an MI, one complication of uh, having a, a myocardial infarction is ventricular septal defect. That is uh, a hole or rupture of the wall between the left ventricle and the right ventricle. Now, this will cause a systolic murmur because if there's a hole between the two ventricles during systole, when the left ventricle squeezes, there will be shunting of blood from the left side of the heart to the right side of the heart. So from the area of higher pressure to the area of lower pressure, um, that will cause uh, a systolic murmur. Other causes of um, valvular heart disease are dilated cardiomyopathy, um, bicuspic aortic valve. This is a genetic problem. Um, people are supposed to be born with or usually born with three leaflets in the aortic valve, but sometimes it's two. When it's two, it's a bicuspid aortic valve. A rheumatic fever, connective tissue diseases like lupus, infection, and degeneration of the valves. Now, um, uh, mitral stenosis is um, associated with um, atrial fibrillation, and that's because um, in AFib, blood accumulates in the atria, and it causes the atria to get bigger over time and therefore causes this problem of uh, mitral stenosis. Let's talk about um, acute MIs and the murmurs that we could hear post uh, MI. So after a patient has uh, an MI, um, 
we could hear two murmurs or murmurs due to two different problems, papillary muscle dysfunction or rupture and a ventricular septal defect. These are both systolic murmurs, best heard at the fifth intercostal space. Um, and the problem with the papillary muscle rupture is that it's a surgical emergency and needs to be fixed as soon as possible. So for the CCRN exam, you could get asked a question that says patient has aortic stenosis or aortic um, valve regurgitation. Uh, it goes on to tell you some other stuff and then it asks you where to listen for this, the murmur of this aortic stenosis. So you need to know all your auscultation points like we talked about before. So if they're talking about a problem with the aortic valve, you listen at the second intercostal space, right sternal border. If they're talking about a problem with the mitral valve, you listen at the fifth intercostal space, uh, mid-clavicular line, and so on and so forth with the, all the other valves. Now we're going to talk about blood pressure. So when we talk about blood pressure, we know we have two blood pressure values, the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure. Um, this is how I explain blood pressure to myself. So blood pressure is the amount of force that the arterial blood vessels experience. It's the amount of force exerted on the arterial blood vessels when blood is moving through them. So the force is actually caused by um, the blood kind of exerting pressure on the walls of the blood vessels. So systolic blood pressure is the maximum amount of force that the arterial blood vessels experience during systole, that is when the left ventricle is ejecting blood out into the system. Um, the systolic blood pressure is also an indirect measure of cardiac output, that is the amount of blood that the left ventricle pushes out to the body um, during systole uh, per minute. Diastolic blood pressure, on the other hand, is the minimum amount of pressure or force that the arterial blood vessels experience during diastole when the heart is filling. And the diastolic blood pressure is also an indirect measure of systemic vascular resistance. Systemic vascular resistance is just a measure of how um, consist, constricted or relaxed the, blood, the arterial blood vessels are. Now, um, diastole usually lasts a third longer than systole because um, this is when the, um, the heart itself gets perfused. And this is also the time when the um, ventricles fill with blood. So we want the ventricle to fill with blood as much as possible so that the left ventricle can then generate enough force to push um, this blood out of the left ventricle and into the um, uh, the systemic uh, circulation. Now, um, we're going to talk about pulse pressure. Pulse pressure is literally the systolic blood pressure minus the diastolic blood pressure. So it is the difference between the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic pressure. So a normal blood pressure is usually 120 over 80. So a normal press pulse pressure would be 120 minus 80, which is 40 millimeters of mercury. Now, pulse pressure is different from MAP, the mean arterial pressure. MAP is the minimum amount of force required to uh, perfuse the body. So it's an indicator of how well the body is being perfused. Um, 60 to 100 of MAP is normal. Now, pulse pressure, on the other hand, um, like we talked about, is the difference between the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure. And we know that during systole, there is more pressure in the arterial system. And during diastole, there's less pressure in the arterial system. And we said that blood pressure is the amount of force exerted um, pretty much on the walls of the blood vessels. So while MAP is talking about getting the body perfused, um, pulse pressure is talking about the pressure on the walls of the arterial um, vessels. So I, I uh, watched a video um, by an anesthesiologist on YouTube. Uh, the name of the channel is Count Backwards from 10. And the doctor explained pulse pressure in a way that I could understand it. So he used um, he used like a, a blood vessel. He drew a blood vessel with a bubble in it and then the blood vessel continued. 
so like a hose in the cartoon so you have um, when you see a hose in a cartoon a water hose and water is going through it you see the tubing it's normal and then you see like a big balloon on the tubing and then the tubing is normal again and then you see another big balloon on the tubing i hope this is making sense so that big balloon on the tubing is caused by the heart squeezing during systole so you have you know during diastole the the vessel is normal size and you get a squeeze during systole you get a balloon so then it, it the the water hose appears to be pulsatile in in nature so like a pulse you know you have a bump and then no bump a bump and then no bump a bump and then no bump so that's kind of the way i see pulse pressure you know it's this pulsatile wave going through the the blood vessels so pulse pressure could be wide or it could be narrow when the pulse pressure is wide, it means that um, it's greater than 40 millimeters of mercury. When the pulse pressure is narrow, it means that it's less than 40 millimeters of mercury. Mercury. So the only way um, we could have a wide or narrow pulse pressure is if there is a, uh, a difference, large or small, between the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure. Because remember systolic blood pressure minus diastolic blood pressure gives us the pulse pressure so let's talk about um a wide pulse pressure this is when the pulse pressure is greater than 40 millimeters of mercury so now what could make the pulse pressure wide anything that increases the systolic blood pressure significantly or anything that decreases the diastolic blood pressure significantly so let's talk about um aortic regurgitation now in aortic regurg regurgitation, blood is coming back into the left ventricle through the aortic valve. So the left ventricle squeezes, it squeezes blood out into the arterial blood vessels, and then some of that blood comes back, which means that there is less blood in the arteries than there should be. So therefore, the diastolic blood pressure will fall. Because remember, during diastole, we, we have blood sitting in the, in the vessels. Even when there is no squeeze from the heart, there's still blood sitting there. And that blood exerts pressure on the walls of the, um, the arteries. So this pressure is the diastolic blood pressure. So now if you have less blood than usual sitting in the, um, in the arteries, you have a, the diastolic blood pressure is less. So therefore, when you do your systolic blood pressure, minus your diastolic blood pressure, you see that the pulse pressure you get is going to be wide. So that is aortic regurgitation. There's less volume in the arteries. So diastolic blood pressure is less, giving us a um, wide pulse pressure. Another situation that could cause a wide um, pulse pressure is sepsis. So in sepsis, the blood vessels are dilated. Systemic vascular resistance is low and when this happens diastolic blood pressure falls so when the diastolic blood pressure falls and we take an equation systolic blood pressure minus diastolic blood pressure our pulse pressure is wide now let's talk about um the narrow blood uh, pulse pressure what could make the pulse pressure narrow um let's take the systolic blood pressure what could make the systolic blood pressure low cardiogenic shock could make the blood pressure low. Cardiac tamponade could make the blood systolic blood pressure low. Bleeding could make the systolic blood pressure low. And aortic stenosis could make the blood pressure low. Why do all these things make the systolic blood pressure low? Because cardiac output is reduced. So in, in cardiogenic shock, the, the left ventricle does not generate enough force to push blood out into the um, system. So that bubble we get during systole is less. Therefore, systolic blood pressure is less. So systolic blood pressure minus diastolic blood pressure is going to be less than 40 because systolic blood pressure at this time is low. When we talk about bleeding, we're talking about hypovolemia. So in hypovolemia, there is less volume in the left ventricle um, to be pushed out into the system. So when there is not enough blood, uh, blood in the left ventricle, it cannot generate enough force to cause that big bubble in the, um, remember when I say big bubble, I'm just talking in the sense of cartoon to paint a picture um, for us to understand better. 
um, what's going on in the arterial system. So um, like I was saying, in hypovolemia, there isn't enough blood volume in the left ventricle to be pushed out into the system. Therefore, systolic blood pressure is low. When we talk about aortic stenosis, remember the aortic valve is narrow. So again, there is not enough volume um, getting out of the left ventricle to cause that big bubble that we expect during systole. And in cardiac tamponade, the, there is fluid in the pericardial um, space. And this fluid exerts a compressing pressure on the heart. So it, it compresses the heart. So then the heart is like someone giving you a tight hug and you can't, you can't like, you can't stretch yourself out because they are compressing you. So same thing with the heart. Fluid is compressing the heart. It can generate enough force to push blood out into the system and therefore cardiac output is low. So all these things cause the systolic blood pressure to be low and therefore for the pressure um, the blood vessels experience during systole to be low, therefore for the systolic blood pressure to be low, causing a narrow um, pulse pressure. So when you have blood pressure values um, on the CCRN test, you know, look at the values and think about um, pulse pressure, look at the systolic blood pressure, look at the diastolic blood pressure, and um, try to use this information to see if the pulse pressure is wide or if the pulse pressure is narrow and what could be causing it. Um, this is the way um, I uh, understanding and this is the way I would use it on the um, CCRN exam. I hope this um, audio study guide has been useful to you. If so, please subscribe to my channel, share this video, and I will see you in the next video.